you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Matthew chapter 4. And pull out those notes that are in your worship guide. In light of the text today, we wanted to dive into the Word right after confession, because there is such a close tie between Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and the battles that every one of us fight against sin in the world, battles with temptation that you and I are fighting now, even at this moment. So I want to I read this text, a story that may be familiar to some of us, but I'm convinced a story whose meaning I think we're in danger of missing. So not long ago, I received a book that was written by a friend of mine from Southern Seminary, Russell Moore. The book's title was Tempted and Tried. It's a book that analyzes temptation based on Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And to, to put it bluntly, I have never read anything better on Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11 than this book. And, and so I immediately endorsed that book and couldn't wait until the moment where we as a faith family would come to this text. So here we are today, and there's a lot I want to cover. You can see there's practically a book in your notes right there. Um, and I just would say from the beginning, I'm indebted to Dr. Moore for how he has helped point me to the truth of this text. And a lot of what I share today is the overflow of what I've learned from studying through that text alongside him, in a sense. And there will be a few points where I quote directly from him. So let's, let's read this story and then ask God by his spirit to teach us his word. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, And set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let's, Let's pray. Father, we know the devil and demons and trials and temptations and testing, they're all real. Even as we sit here in this room this morning with our heads bowed, we know that we are surrounded by spiritual warfare. At this moment, there are spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms who are warring against your worship in this room. and warring against our minds and our hearts and our souls. I'm cognizant of this spiritual battle being waged even now as I pray and as I'm about to preach and as people listen. So, so together we pray in total dependence on your spirit. We ask of you, we plead of you, show your power and your supremacy in this room and in our lives. You are the one who has conquered sin and Satan. So help us to see Christ clearly today. Help us to realize what it means to be in him as we fight spiritual battles, the fight of faith in our lives and in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Before we dive into the text, very quickly, six realities that are really reminders as we approach this text, 
reminders that we talked about actually at the end, a few months ago at the end of First, Ch- First Timothy. So reality number one, there is a spiritual world. Let me say from the start, we don't, we don't know when we see the devil tempting Jesus these three times in Matthew chapter 4, we don't know exactly how this played out. Did the devil appear in a physical form or in some kind of spiritual form? How did each of these temptations actually physically take place? But what we do know is the devil is real and the devil is active. We do know that there is an invisible spiritual world that is just as real as the natural visible world around us. To expand on this picture in Matthew chapter 4, Scripture teaches that there are vast numbers of angels, both good and bad, spirits that exist all around us. There are glorious beings that would take our breath away at this moment if we could see them. There are evil beings who would horrify us at this moment if we could see them. So just just. Feel the weight of that. We must avoid an empty rationalism that has no room for supernatural, spiritual. If we can't see it, then it's not real. Not, not true. So we've got to avoid an empty rationalism. At the same time, we need to avoid an excessive fanaticism that sees a devil behind every bush. So we've got to avoid both. There is a spiritual world, which means, second, we are involved in a spiritual war. A spiritual battle that is continually raging. And this battle is between conflicting kingdoms. The kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of darkness. Warring against one another. This is history. All of history is a story of spiritual warfare. It began, man and woman, Genesis chapter 3, where where the enemy, Satan, tempts man, leads him into sin, spiritual darkness, and ultimately death. And from that moment in Genesis chapter 3, all the world and its inhabitants have been darkened with sin under the rule of the prince of this world. Now we see just a few chapters after that, God take a people for himself from the midst of the darkness, intended to be a display of his light, but even those people cannot overcome the darkness. Abraham, who he starts with, a friend of God, lying about his wife. Jacob, who, whose name is changed to Israel. Beloved by God, deceitfully scheming to receive God's blessing. Moses, the prophet of God, dishonoring and defaming the holiness of God. David, the king after God's heart, adultery, murder. Over and over and over again in history, spiritual battles and men and women falling prey to the evil one and experiencing the punishment of sin, death. That's history. Conflicting kingdoms. They create a continual struggle in every one of our lives. Now, I put Christians and demons here, which can be a little bit misleading because this battle is not just between Christians and demons, but all people and and demons. But the reason I put Christians and demons there is to emphasize two things. First, when we think about spiritual warfare, one of the first things we need to remember is that the, the devil is not omnipresent like God is. So when you are being tempted and I'm being tempted, we need to remember that Satan is only a creature. And though he is behind every temptation to do evil, our battle is not just against him, but against what Ephesians 6 calls the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Demons, powers of this dark world. The second reason I put Christians and demons there is because I want us to remember that when we talk about temptation as Christians, temptation is not ultimately just about what's going on in your life or what's going on in my life. Temptation is ultimately about an all-out attack from the devil and his demons on the kingdom of Christ and everyone who associates themselves with Christ. In attacking Christians, demons are attacking Christ. Which is why, if you will notice, Christian, when you trusted in Christ for salvation, temptation did not stop. If anything, temptation has ratcheted it up more notches. Because the devil and all his demons are dead set in Scripture on destroying the Messiah, and then flowing from that, devouring every one of his followers. So when we talk about temptation, we're not just talking about some psychological battle in our heads. We're talking about an intense spiritual war against cosmic powers of darkness who were dead set on destroying the kingdom of Christ and the children of God. We're involved in a spiritual war. Our enemy in the spiritual war is formidable. 
is a lion looking to devour. The stakes in the spiritual war are eternal. Heaven and hell hang in the balance with this war. The scope of the spiritual war is universal. It is being waged in every nation, among every people, in every language, and in every life, which leads to this last reality, this last reminder. Our involvement in this spiritual war is personal. So, so here's the deal. Don't miss this. There is a grand overarching realm in which this war is being waged. But there is also a specific, pointed, personal way that this battle is being fought right now in the seat where you sit. So it's grand, cosmic, and specific, personal. You are being tempted right now. I am being tempted right now. Always being tempted in our, in our lives. Most of the time we don't even realize it. Dr. Moore subtitled one of the chapters in that book. You are on the verge of wrecking your life, especially if you don't know it. And that is true. And he uses an illustration of cows being led to the slaughter. Let me apologize in advance to vegetarians who are here this morning. This may be one of the reasons why you are a vegetarian. But he writes, for a long time, cattle workers would forcefully push and prod cows into the slaughterhouse. For good reason, the cows would resist, and the whole operation would be extremely difficult to carry out. Until one particular scientist came along and said, no, 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 the way to slaughter cows is to make them feel like everything is great as they enter into the slaughterhouse. Keep the scenery the same as it is in the most peaceful moments of the cow's life. The scientists began to experiment, not with prodding cows off a truck but by leading them quietly onto a ramp where they walk through a squeeze chute, a gentle pressure device designed to mimic a mother's nuzzling touch. Then the cattle continue down the ramp onto a smoothly curving path, no sudden turns, a path designed to give the cows a sense that they are going home. And as they mosey along the path, they don't even notice when their hooves are no longer touching the ground. A conveyor belt slowly, gradually lifts them upward And then, in the twinkling of an eye, a blunt instrument levels a surgical strike right between their eyes. Their transition from livestock to meat, and they're never aware enough to even be alarmed by any of it. And I share that to make as clear as possible to you that there are forces afoot at this moment who are working to lure you to a place that you do not want to go. To use Russ Moore's warning, you are on the verge of wrecking your life, especially if you don't know it. I, I feel this at every moment in my life. I'm prone to sin every point of my life. My mind is susceptible to wandering and I'm tempted to think unimaginable thoughts when I see an attractive woman who is not my wife. My heart is bent toward pride and I am tempted to compete with other pastors over who is more spiritual and more successful. I'm tempted to cut moral corners in order to gain personal advantage over others. I'm prone to pretense and hypocrisy. Tempted to lie to make myself look better and to call people to do what I'm not willing to do myself. I'm prone to value appearance over authenticity, my wants over other people's needs, and I am prone to desire the glory that is due God alone. I am keenly, if not frightening, frighteningly aware that one wrong look, one inappropriate meeting, one rash decision, one fleeting moment could wreak spiritual havoc on my life, my family, and this church and bring untold disgrace on my God. I say that to make clear that my involvement in this spiritual war is personal and so is every one of yours. The battles may look different all across this room, but do not be fooled. The war is real and the evil one is persistently plotting to subtly entice your soul to evil and ultimately bring you to destruction. Do not be caught unaware. There's a spiritual world. We're involved in a spiritual war. Our enemy is formidable. The stakes are eternal. The scope is universal and our involvement is personal. All of us. We are part of a human race. We're over and over and over and over and over again in history. Every man and every woman has succumbed to sin and every man and every woman has 
has experienced death except one. And that's the good news of Matthew 4, 1 through 11. A new man has come, a man over whom Satan could not gain control. So see it, two pictures of Jesus in what we just read. One, Jesus is the new man stepping in to the universal human story. There are deliberate parallels here between Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew 4 and Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. It is no coincidence that both Adam and Jesus are initially tempted to eat food apart from the Father's will. For Adam, it was fruit from a tree. For Jesus, it was stones becoming bread. In both of their situations, the temptations begin with questioning God. For Adam, the serpent questions God's word, asking, did God really say not to eat that? For Jesus, the serpent doubts Christ's sonship. If you are really the son of God, why are you hungry like this? See it. Jesus is stepping into the same story that Adam stepped into. Jesus will stand where Adam fell. He is a new man, unlike Adam and unlike all of us in this universal human story who have succumbed to sin. So he is the new man stepping into the universal human story, and Jesus is the true son suffering through the particular Israelite story. So... So there are parallels between Matthew 4 and Genesis 3, but there are even more parallels between Jesus' temptation here and the testing of God's people before they entered in the promised land in the Old Testament. Now, you say, what do you mean Jesus is the true son? Well, when you go back, we won't have time to turn to any of these places, so there'll be a variety of verses along the way. You might just write out to the side. But when, when God was preparing to deliver Israel, the people of Israel, his people, out of slavery in Egypt, In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, he said, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son, talking to Pharaoh, let my son go so that he may serve me. So God refers to Israel, the people of Israel, as his son. Let my son go. It's what we saw a couple of weeks ago when we were in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, when Hosea said, God called his son out of Egypt. It's talking about the people of Israel. Referred to as his son. So Israel is referenced as his son. And what you have in the Old Testament is God's son Israel being led through the wilderness to be tested. And now, in the New Testament, you have God's son Jesus being led through the wilderness to be tested. Parallels are all over the place, both in the wilderness. In the Old Testament, God's son Israel was tempted for and tested for 40 years. Here in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is tested for how many days? Forty days and nights, he's fasting. Every time Jesus wards off temptation here in Matthew chapter 4, he uses scripture. And where does he quote from? Look at first time, verse 4. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Look for that little letter in your Bible. It takes you to the bottom and helps you understand where he's quoting from. Where is he quoting from there? What book? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter what? 8, verse 3. Now look at the next time. He quotes from Scripture. Verse 7, Jesus again said to him, It's written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Where is he quoting from there? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. You go to the last one, verse 10. It's written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There it's, what book? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. So three times from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8, both passages that are specifically referencing Israel's testing in the wilderness. So Jesus, in the context of temptation, is pointing us back to exactly what happened when God's son Israel was tested in the Old Testament. And then, last parallel I'll point out, in the Old Testament story, right before God's son Israel was tested, God delivered them out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea. Remember that? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, Paul talks about how that deliverance was Israel's baptism. And so, right before their testing, God led them out through the waters, through a picture of baptism. And so, what did we study last week, right before the temptation story that we come to this week? What did we look at? The baptism of Jesus. And so, we see Jesus coming out of the waters, now into the wilderness to be tested. So, The reason that all of that's important, it's not just, hey, that's kind of cool information. The reason that's so important is because everything, 
in Matthew chapter 4, revol- and, and, and this temptation story revolves around understanding what it means for Jesus to be Son and God to be Father. You'll notice that the first two times Jesus is tempted, what are the first words out of Satan's mouth? If you are the Son of God. Every temptation here in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, is an assault on sonship. Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, if so, then why are you starving? If so, then jump off this temple. If so, then you can have all of these things. And don't miss it. Why this is so important, it's because this is where we begin to realize, and I want to be careful not to get into it yet because we're about to dive into it specifically, but just see it. Every temptation in your life and in my life is a temptation to see God as rival, not as father. It's all the way back in the beginning, Genesis chapter 3. Satan convincing Adam and Eve that God is their rival, not their father. He, he's, he's withholding something from them that is good. And every time you or I sin, it is you or I saying, my father does not know what is best for me. I know what is better. And so see the tie between temptation and sonship here. Because it's exactly where we are tempted. Every sin that you or I commit is tantamount to a rejection of God as our Father. In that that moment, in that instant, as the one who knows what is best for us and is committed to providing for us. So, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's the deal. Two questions that often come up when people come to this passage. And I've got to fly through these, but I think they're worth noting because I know they're out there. One, does God tempt us? Matthew 4, verse 1 says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he was led by the Spirit to be tempted. What does that mean? Does God tempt us? And the clear answer that Scripture gives to that question is no. God never tempts us in the sense of enticing us to evil. James 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Instead, Satan is seen in all the Scripture, and in Matthew chapter 4 here, as the tempter. So we are tempted by Satan, who is subordinate for evil. And I emphasize subordinate there to help us understand the next point. Yes, only the devil and the demons tempt us to evil. But we need to remember that even their tempting to evil, though directly attributable to them, is ultimately under the sovereign control of who? Of God. Nothing happens in the universe apart from the sovereignty of God. And this is where we see God in the picture, not as tempting for evil, but as testing for good. So here's the deal. We are tempted by Satan, who is subordinate for evil, and we are tested by God, who is sovereign for good. So realize this. Temptation by the devil, who is subordinate toward evil, is ultimately a part of testing by God, who is sovereign for good. We know this from the book of Job. We know in the book of Job, it's clear, Satan is on a leash. He can do nothing outside of the sovereign power, permission, prerogative of God. Yet, Satan tempts Job under God's sovereignty, and in the end, it is used for Job's good. Testing for good, under that umbrella, tempting by the devil for evil. Same thing, Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. There was given him a a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment him. Why? So that through this, he would, Paul would learn the s- supremacy of God's strength and the sufficiency of God's grace. So this was tempting toward evil, messenger of Satan tormenting him, used for good in Paul's life under the sovereignty of God. Genesis chapter 50. Joseph, sinfully sold into slavery by his brothers and then tempted with all kinds of temptations along the way evil temptations and sin all under the banner of a sovereign God who uses this testing in Joseph's lives to bring about good for Joseph and all of his brothers who sought to kill him. So hear hear the picture here. And it's it's here in Matthew chapter 4. The Spirit of God is leading Jesus into a time of testing just as he led the people of Israel into the wilderness for a time of testing. But God is definitively not tempting Jesus here in Matthew chapter 4. God is definitively not tempting Israel in the Old Testament, and God is definitively never going to tempt you to evil in your life. 
Instead, what he's going to do in his sovereignty is use Satan's attempts to tempt you to evil to bring about good in your life. That's exactly what we see here in Matthew chapter 4. So that's the first question. Does God tempt us? Now the second question people sometimes ask. Could Jesus have sinned? Could Jesus really have sinned? Now I want to take a poll here, okay? So there's two options here. Yes or no. So could Jesus have sinned? How many of you think, yes, Jesus could have sinned? Okay, how many of you think, no, Jesus could not have sinned? Okay, it's uh, split and the majority of you did not vote. Okay, so <laughs> I appreciate the boldness of those of you who did. So the answer is, no and yes. So, you're right on both of them. So let me explain briefly here, okay? So four truths that pertain to this question that we know without a doubt from Scripture. One, Jesus is fully man. We've talked about this. We know that Jesus is fully man, like you and me, man. Second, Jesus was fully tempted. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 4, that he was tempted just as we are. He was tempted with things that are common to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Now, we need to remember this. When we look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, we might start to think, well, I'm just not tempted in these ways. To be honest, these temptations don't seem that bad. Maybe they even sound trivial. Like I've never been tempted to jump off a tower or to tell some stones to become bread. This is just foreign to me. Well, the reality is, as we're about to see in a second, there are no new temptations. There are simply new ways of succumbing to old temptations that have been there ever since Genesis chapter 3. So clearly, people in the New Testament didn't have the internet and TV and some of the stuff that we have that brings temptation into our lives. But do not be fooled into thinking that we have come upon something new. The adversary's strategies are age old, going all the way back to a garden in Genesis chapter 3. And you will not face a temptation that is not common to man. And you will not face a temptation that Jesus himself has not faced. And so he was fully tempted as we are, Hebrews chapter 4 says. No new temptations, just old new ways of succumbing to old temptations. Jesus was tempted just like you and I are tempted. Third, Jesus is fully God. We've talked about this. He's fully man. He's fully God. And then fourth, God cannot be tempted. Just as James 1.13 said that God does not tempt us to evil, it also says God cannot be tempted by evil. So, you, we know these four things to be true. Jesus is fully man, Jesus was fully tempted, Jesus is fully God, and God cannot be tempted. The problem comes when you try to put those together and figure out how they work. And all of this leads us back to the mystery of the incarnation. Remember we talked about this a few weeks ago before Christmas? We talked about how Jesus' human nature and divine nature are unified and yet different. Which leads us to some wonderful mysteries. It's a picture of his humanity. He was asleep on a boat in the middle of a storm. As a picture of his deity, he stood up and calmed the wind and the waves in that storm. Fully human, fully God. Humanity, deity. So in his humanity, Jesus was fully tempted as we said, just as we are, as men and women. And it was possible that he could sin. Yet in his deity, he was not tempted, for God cannot be tempted. And so it was not possible that he could sin. So how do you put these mind-boggling mysteries together? Well, think about it this way. Think of the person in the world that you love the most. Picture them. And then let me ask you an absolutely horrifying question. Could you murder that person? And as soon as I ask that, you're thinking, absolutely not. I am repulsed at the very idea that you would even mention that. There's no way I could hurt that person in that way that I love so much. And in that response, what you're thinking is, I don't have the moral capability of murdering that person. But if you understood my question, could you murder that person, in terms of physically performing an action, though it's unfathomable to you, it would be physically possible. So, in a similar way, Jesus, in his deity, as the light of the world in whom there is no darkness, could not have sinned. His moral nature is incapable of that kind of action. At the same time, in his humanity, Jesus could have sinned, in the sense that he was absolutely capable, 
capable of turning stones into bread, jumping off a tower, and bowing the knee to Satan. He was fully tempted as we are. So, now that we have all of that cleared up, we will get to the three temptations. So, we're going to we're gonna have to fly here too, but I want, us to, I want us to get below the surface of these. See the core of temptation here. To bring that core to bear on how we are tempted. That's why you look at your notes and you'll say, we are tempted to. We are tempted to because what we are seeing happening in Jesus is common to man. He's being tempted as we are. So to see how, think about how this plays out in our lives. And then I want us to see how Jesus conquered each temptation. We'll hit them one by one. First, temptation. Self-gratification. Self-gratification. After 40 days of fasting, the Bible says Jesus was hungry. That's quite an understatement, Matthew. And the devil tempts him to turn stones into bread and eat, if he is the Son of God. Remember, Jesus' understanding of his sonship is central to our understanding of the devil's temptation. The devil is saying to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, if you are beloved by God, Matthew three seventeen, then why are you out here in the wilderness starving? You desire food. Is your father not providing for you, caring for you? Satisfy your desires now. See the self-gratification here that is common to every single one of us in this room at the depth of our hearts. We are tempted to fulfill our wants apart from from God's will. Every one of us. We have, we have desires. All of us have desires that God has built into us. Desires that are good. Physical desires, emotional desires. Needs in our bodies, cravings in our souls. God's created us with these things. And He's created them in such a way that we are intended to look to Him as our Father to gratify those desires. That was the whole point in the Garden of Eden, Right? God had created Adam and Eve with a desire for food. And it was a very good desire, Genesis 1.31. But he created it to be fulfilled according to his word in his way. And Satan ushered into the world the idea, temptation, that God is withholding some kind of good from Adam and Eve. They have a hunger, a desire, a craving, a want that they need to fulfill apart from God's will. And that is when sin entered into the world. It's there in Genesis 3. It's the same story of what happened in the wilderness with the manna that God provided. And it's why Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let me give you the whole quotation. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. You should remember the whole way the Lord, follow this, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you. So this is what God was doing, leading into the wilderness, giving the manna day by day, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This was a testing of the heart to see if they would trust the goodness of God to fulfill the desires in their lives according to his will and his word. And this is the testing of of your heart and my heart that accompanies every temptation in our lives. You have desires. I have desires. Desires that are good. Desires that are created by God for food, for water, for sleep, for sex, for relationship, for companionship. All of these desires are good. And they are the point at which Satan works in your life and mine. So you desire food that is good. And Satan takes that which is good and he tempts you toward undisciplined overeating. You desire sleep and he tempts you toward apathy and laziness. You desire sex and he tempts you toward lust, pornography, adultery, homosexuality. You desire this or you desire that and he tempts you at the point of your desires to fulfill those God-given wants apart from God's given word. You think about it. Just... Analyze sexual temptation for a minute. Whether it's pornography or homosexuality, or adultery and affair. You think about it. What is, what is so rampant across our culture and rampant in the church. 
you have a sexual desire that is created by God to be good. But you are tempted to fulfill that desire in ways that are outside of God's will and God's word. And at the core of that temptation is a desire for self-gratification that says, God is not providing the way I want him to, and so I will seek my own gratification apart from him. And you sin. Whether it's a look, a thought, action, a deed. It's where it's birthed out of. And that's one of thousands and thousands of other examples all across this room. We are tempted to fulfill our wants apart from God's will. And the devil is so subtly deadly in the way he attacks our desires. He has convinced many of you that these desires that you have for sin in certain areas, they are just the way you are. They are just who you are. Come back to the core, Christian brother or sister. This is not who you are. You are a child of God. You are a son or a daughter of God. And just because you have a desire that leads you toward temptation doesn't mean that that's just who you're destined to be. Now, the reality is you may fight with that desire for 40 days or for 40 years or for a lifetime. It will be a battle. But the way to fight that battle, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, is the same way Jesus did, by trusting in the all-satisfying, all-sufficient goodness of the Father. This is what Jesus did. Jesus did not tell the Father, when and how his desires should be fulfilled. Instead, he trusted God to fulfill those desires in his way according to his word. So how do you fight self-gratification, fulfilling wants apart from God's will? You fight it by believing, by trusting, by realizing that your Father is good. And realizing and believing and knowing that every attempt to satisfy your wants apart from his will will not lead you to delight. It will lead you to destruction. So it always, it's Genesis 3. No sooner had they taken that fruit into their stomach, everything changed. Between them, between them and God, in the world, everything. If they could have that moment back, they knew now, no, this doesn't satisfy. It's Jacob and Esau. What leads to the formation of the people of Israel in that story was Esau selling his birthright because he's hungry for a bowl of soup. No sooner had that soup filled his stomach than he was certainly thinking, what have I done? I've just given away my whole future for a bowl of soup. It's, it's Judas in greed for money betraying Jesus to have 30 pieces of silver that then become the means by which a field is bought where he hangs to his death. The bread of the devil always leads to destruction. And, and yet, it suddenly deceives you, convincing you that it will lead to delight. So you fight it by saying, no, only my Father can bring the delight to my soul that I need. I fulfill, I want to fulfill my wants according to His will. I want to live according to His word as my sustenance and my sufficiency and my satisfaction. You fight self-gratification with supreme satisfaction in the goodness of your Father. Jesus did that, and by the end of this story, Jesus' desire for food is being supernaturally fulfilled. Second temptation, self-gratification, then self-protection. Self-protection. Now, this temptation is probably the most difficult to understand because we, we struggle to see what is so enticing about the possibility of Jesus jumping off of a tower. But this was no normal tower. This was the temple, the place that was a visible demonstration of God's presence and his protection among his people. So Satan gets into the Bible quoting business from Psalm 91. 
a song about God's protection. And he tempts Jesus to prove that God will be faithful to him as his son by jumping off. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down and he'll save you. Send to angels. And once again, Jesus' response here, going back to Deuteronomy, helps us understand the essence of this temptation. Because he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, which says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's where it stops here in verse 7. But if you go back to Deuteronomy 6, 16, it says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Which takes us back to Exodus chapter 17, when the people of God were wandering in the wilderness, experiencing the testing of God. They began to complain about not having enough water. And their response was, is God really among us or not? They began to question the presence of God, the provision of God, the protection of God over them. They began to complain and grumble, and they put God to a test. Okay, if you're really with us, then show us by doing this for us presuming upon God, thinking that faith is demanding something of God, and once he meets your demands, then you will trust in him. And it's the core of what we all experience, just like they were tempted in the Old Testament, just like Jesus is being tempted here in the New Testament. We are tempted to question God's presence and manipulate God's promises, to put God to the test. Here in Matthew 4, to force the Father to show that Jesus was truly the Son by miraculously delivering him. This would be tantamount to asking God for proof of his presence and protection. That kind of callous experimentation with God is a clear example of a lack of trust in God. And it shows up in all kinds of ways in your life and mine. We are tempted to twist God's word around our personal preferences. We are tempted to question God's plans for us when they don't go the way we would like. We are tempted to doubt his love when something goes wrong. We're tempted to ask for signs that he's still with us and he will show his presence to us when he has shown his faithfulness to us over and over and over again. We are tempted to complain to him about the circumstances of our lives, boldly thinking, if not saying out loud, just like the Israelites did, God, are you with me or not? So how did Jesus resist that temptation? He rested in the shelter of the the Father's unshakable security. He knew he had no reason to test the Father, for as his Son, he was secure. And this is what Jesus will say to us over and over and over again in the book of Matthew. Do not worry, he'll say in the Sermon on the Mount. You have a Father in heaven. He takes care of the birds, of the air, and the flowers of the field. He will provide for you. He's a Father. You're his child. You don't have to presume upon him. He's a good father. I, I'm, I try to be a good father. I, I love my three kids. Mary Ruth adjusting so well. Two boys had Guy's Day out yesterday at Monster Jam 2012. I love these kids. and I want to protect them and provide for them. I, I want to do anything I can to protect them. And Luke 11 says, I'm an evil father. God is a good father. Everything he does in our lives is good. Everything. Every, and by everything, I mean everything. Even the most difficult things. Everything he does. He's a good father. Everything that comes from his hand is good. We can trust him. So we need not ask him to prove himself. We are his children. Rest in the security of what that means. Unshakable security. Jesus does that. And by the end of the story, the father has sent angels to minister to him third temptation, self-exaltation. Self-exaltation. Jesus taken to a very high mountain, or at the very least given a very high vision of all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And you might think, well, doesn't Jesus know that he's going to have all of these things? Maybe he does. But he also knows that the road ahead, the path that leads to gaining that kind of authority, is filled with sorrow, suffering, and ultimately a violent death on a cross. So certainly there was temptation to have all of these things now apart from that painful path. You're the son, the devil, has, the devil says. Why, why, why be a servant? You're the king. Why are you going to be crucified? Take these things now. They're yours for the taking. And it's the same thing that he whispers in your ears and mine. 
Look, look at the things of this world. All the successes, all the accomplishments, all the accolades, all the things, all the stuff, all the pleasures, all the pursuits, all the possessions. Like they're yours. Take them. Live. That's what he told Adam and Eve. Eat the fruit and you'll live. You'll be like God. And they believed him. And in their believing him, they ascribed worth to him instead of worship to God. Same thing we are tempted to do, to assert ourselves in the world while we rob God of his worship. Instead of a life of trusting, humble, difficult obedience to God in this world, in our pride we say, I'm going to attain what I want in the way I want to do it. My plans, my pleasures, my pursuits, my possessions. Do not miss the danger of pride. It's the root of all our rebellion. We all struggle with pride. And if your first thought is, I don't struggle with pride, sounds like you're proud of that. You see, self-gratification, self-protection, self-exaltation. It looks different in our lives. The core of sin is a taking a dethroning of the God who alone is worthy of worship and replacing it with someone, something that we think ultimately ourself more worthy. So how did Jesus resist that temptation? I'll quote directly here from Russ Moore because I can't improve on his words. Jesus refused to exchange the end time exaltation by the Father for a right now exaltation of a snake. Jesus, the beloved son, knew the supreme duty of every single person on the planet is to worship God. And he knew that everyone who humbles himself before the Lord will be exalted. So he chose to live a life of suffering obedience to the Father instead of sinful submission to Satan. And in the end, all authority in heaven and earth were given to God. We face these battles every day. Today, the rest of the day, you will be tempted toward self-gratification, self-protection, and self-exaltation. And you will face these battles tomorrow, and the next day, and every day this week, and so on, and so on, and so on, until the day that Revelation chapter 12 describes. And I'll put these verses here on the screen. We don't have time to turn to them, but you've got to hear them. Listen to this. Now war arose in heaven, Revelation 12, verse 7. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives even unto death therefore rejoice O heavens and you who dwell in them ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters there is coming a day when ultimately finally and eternally Christ will be crowned as king the Christ who 2,000 years ago in Matthew 4 conquered temptation as our representative and then not long thereafter conquered sin as our Savior on the cross. He conquered sin as our Savior. You think about how we're going to see these temptations play out as Jesus goes to the cross. As he's hanging on the cross and it's shouted to him, if you are the Son of God, not coincidentally, if you're the Son of God, throw your, bring yourself down. Certainly the Son of God would not be up here. Assault on his sonship. Jesus says to Peter, I know that at this, any moment I could call down 12 legions of angels to come and deliver me from this cross. Instead, he bows the knee in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, not my will but yours be done. Father, glorify your name. He lives for the worship of the Father and he dies and in the process becomes the only one who is able to take your sin and my sin upon himself pure and unstained, fully able to pay the price for our iniquity. And then to rise from the grave in victory over sin and death and to ascend into heaven. So 2,000 years ago, he has conquered sin as our Savior. Today, he is at the right hand of the Father fighting with and for us through his Spirit. To use Paul's words, we are like lambs led to the slaughter. No, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. God is for us. We say it. Who can be against us? 
Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. He has given you and me, Christian, His Spirit. The Spirit, very same Spirit who led Him in and through the wilderness here, unscathed. It's the same Spirit who is alive in you. Brothers and sisters, you cannot conquer temptation. But Christ in you can. And He is in you. He's the hope of glory. So on one hand, I want you to feel a sense of how endangered you are, how vulnerable you are. At the same time, I want you to feel a sense of how empowered you are. There's always a way out, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and the way out is Christ. So live in Him until one day He will reign over all as our sovereign. He will once and for all assert His authority over all creation. When He comes, Christ will be crowned as King. Satan will be cast down in defeat. Revelation 12, that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the seer of the whole world, he will be thrown down to the earth. His angels will be thrown down with Him. The accuser will stand accused. Ha! The serpent will be sentenced and the devil will be destroyed. Revelation 20 continues saying, The devil who is deceived will be thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur to be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. Christ will be crowned as king. Satan will be cast down in defeat and the church will rise in victory. Oh, church, victory is assured. Sons and daughters of God, we may be in wartime now, but peacetime is coming. And so as we work and fight and wait for that day, as children of God in Christ, let's trust the all-satisfying, all-sufficient goodness of our Father. Let's let His love be the supreme satisfaction of our souls. Let's trust Him. Let's trust His Word. Let's trust His will. He knows what is best for us. He is not your rival. He is your Father. As children of God in Christ, let's rest in the shelter of our Father's unshakable security. We have no reason to fear We have no reason to ever worry. We have no reason to doubt. We have no reason to question Him, no reason to complain against Him, in any way be concerned about His presence, His power, His protection for us. Christ has secured all of these things for you and me. So rest in Him. You're His child, and He will always, always, always protect and provide for you. Guaranteed. And as children of God in Christ, let's refuse to exchange our end-time exaltation by the Father for a right-now exaltation of a snake. You say, what do you mean by our end-time exaltation? Did you hear Revelation 12? It's not just a picture of a conquering Christ. It's a picture of a conquering church. For there's coming a day when we will be heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, receiving the ultimate reward of our salvation as we reign with Him in His kingdom. So resist the devil and all of his attacks. Why? Because you are a child of the king on the way to a kingdom.